Hello and welcome to On The Curbs. I'm your host, Team Albus Daly. Joining me this week is European Le Mans driver, Charles Cruz. We caught up recently to chat about how his 2022 season has gone from zero to hero with three back-to-back epic wins at some of the best racetracks in the world. If you'd like to team up with Isla Agron for a race in the future, what the most frustrating part of ELMS's, and much more. So, without any further ado, let's just get straight into it. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi Charles, thanks for being here today. First of all, how are you? Yeah, doing well, thanks. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Still uh, recovering a little bit from being at Petit Le Mans. The long races can tend to suck the life out of you pretty quickly. Someone's got to pull that short straw though, haven't they? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. First question I like to ask everyone who comes on here, what first got you into motorsport? Uh, For me, that'd be my dad. So Mm -hmm. uh, he raced um, for a long time, drag racing, road race, go-karts, it was just kind of a childhood passion, one that his dad didn't necessarily support. He always tells me the stories of, you know, his dad said, oh, only hoodlums and, you know, uh, people, you know, on bad paths were were in racing. And my dad absolutely loved motorsports. Um, so when I was born, you know, we we shared that passion together and it was something that he supported quite a bit, um, which obviously enabled me to to race quite a bit when I was younger. So what were those early years of racing like then for you? What did you start off with? I uh, started karting on my eighth birthday. So it was, you know, pretty early on. And then we took karting quite, you know, professionally and raced all across North America, uh, karting in a little bit in South America as well. But uh, now, yeah, karting got really big, then went to Formula Cars. First time I drove a Formula car, I was 13. And mm-hmm. I did my first full season of what we called Fran Am, but it was a Formula Renault 1600 at, uh, I think I was 14 or 15 then. So, um, then so it's a fairly on. natural and logical progression there. Yeah, it, it was, it was. How did you come to join the European Le Mans series then? Because that's quite a far cry away from, from all of that. <laughs> yes, and, and quite a large timeline away from all of that. So, uh, with I'm skipping uh, it good, slightly, I admit. With as lovely of a story as all that was, it all came to an end because every step up becomes more and more expensive and difficult mm. to, to do. Um, the majority of my funding came from oil and gas industry. Um, being Texan, that's a, a you know large part of our economy here, and um, where you know the wealthy supporters genuinely uh, generally get their. So I can play from. the Dallas theme tune over this part of the of the episode. Yeah. Um, so in in two thousand eight, there was a big dern- downturn in the oil and gas market, and I lost the majority of my funding. So kind of sat there without a drive for for a while, and decided to go back to school which I did. I went back to school, um, did my undergrad, did a MBA, so a master's degree, and then went to law school. Then I worked in a law firm. Did you do the undergrad and the master's in law as well, or was that a difference? No, no. Um, I did the undergrad and master's in business. Okay. Business and law, pretty good combo though. Yeah. No, and, and I think it, it complements itself in motorsports as well. Mm, uh, because I, uh, you know, I, earn my living in motorsports, but not as a driver, as you know, one <laughs> yeah. might amount of being bronze. Um, and yeah, I sat out of motorsports for a long time. I didn't drive for, I think, 12, 13 years. Um, and I was team manager at Hunkos, which is a yeah. IndyCar team now. But when I was there, it was Indy Lights and um, Pro Mazda, which is the evolution of the name there from star Mazda pro Mazda. Now it's Indy pro 2000. Um, by nice the time they, say, they have a different name as well. <laughs> so they, they love changing the name of that championship, but, um, uh, hold up. Do you want me to say, I can, that's all right. It's fine. Not her. Can, can you hear all the crunching in the background? It's not too bad. It's, I don't think okay. people don't mind that. <laughs> you just do the show. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> she's a guest star. Um, so that was the evolution of that. And uh, 
then this kind of bronze writing came about and I was managing Garrett Grist, who's also an ELMS race winner. And um, he is who I was with at Petit Le Mans, really talented, younger Canadian, younger compared to me for sure. Um, and there became a need for bronze and I, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, I've got quite an extensive background. I haven't driven in a long time. So I think I'd come back bronze and it all kind of worked out where, where I became one of these, you know, quite cheater bronzes because I have the background, but I still fulfill the requirements that the uh, FIA set out, uh, you know, set out with mm. how long you had to have not been racing in order to, to come back bronze and the age threshold and all the, all the such. So you say it's all worked out, all right? It kind of has this year quite well, because I mean, three race wins in a row, Monza, Barcelona, Spa, not too shabby, is it? I mean, how, no, did, you, how did you feel about all of that? Um, I'll tell you, it, um, the start of the year didn't feel like that at all. <laughs> we left the first two rounds with four points, I think. Um, Paul Ricard was was the most gutting race of of all of them because we led every single lap except for the last one. Um, There's a lot that of that kind of thing happening this year in the series, <laughs> isn't there? There's always kind of last lap drama after four hours. You think, oh, really? Yeah, I think that four hour magical mark is is quite the hurdle to get over. Um, and you know, we ended up second at Paul Ricard, but then get got disqualified, which was extra gutting um yeah. especially because i would take those 18 points right now i think oh I would, yeah uh, take <laughs> the champions leading the whole way and then second is a bad enough pool to swallow on the day never mind anything else after that yeah it, it was a deteriorating situation to say <laughs> the least um and then i think emila we were all kind of we, we knew from the outset that we should be a championship favorite mm. but I think we really felt that pressure in Emila of we have to make up for Paul Ricard. There's only six races. We've already lost one where we left with zero points. Mm-hmm. Like we've really got to attack. And, you know, we had to work under the assumption that the cool 17 car would, you know, be at a minimum second at, at all these races and be hard to beat in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that outlook hurt me a bit because I was a little over aggressive um, and, Maybe, maybe I'll be a, a proper bronze and not take fault for what happened at Imola. But uh, either way, I was, you know. So um, kind of put putting myself, too much pressure on yourself almost. Exactly. And, and put myself in a position in traffic that was probably not the wise thing to do at the time. We had some contact and damaged the radiator and sat in the garage for 20 minutes. And then it was, you know, two races over, yeah. um, which then led into, into um, Monza, where... We're like, it well, a little more, bit. more or less championship over. So why don't we just do our thing? And, and then it all started to click. So it's, uh, it's funny. I think the focus on the championship is about the worst thing you can do. You just need to do your just own go thing. With and, it and not focus too much on that. And as, as I'm sure that's so much more easier to say than it is in practice, but. Most certainly. And hopefully it, uh, you know, we've, we've got, as nice of a margin as we possibly could for Portimao, but um, it's still not done. We need to be smart no. and, and make sure we, we check all those boxes. And I believe that if we won four in a row at, uh, at Portimao, we'd set a new ELMS record for most consecutive wins and most wins in a season. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, I'd rather put that championship in my pocket than anything else. Yeah. It's, it's, kind of leads into the next question can you make it four in a row or are you kind of obviously you're not going to say i'm not going to go for the win but is it because you say you want to prioritize the championship over the win if, if that's how it works out it's just get the points and then the position will figure that out later yeah and I, I think that's it and um you know i hope the sister car is in a position where it can you know be there to take some points away from the cool car as well you know it's uh Everyone was really it good has, for you they've been on for some strong results as well and haven't capitalized on them. Um, and it's disappointing because I'm close with quite a few of the drivers there. And it's, it's hard to see that we're P1 and they're P last in the championship right now. Um, and they certainly don't deserve to be there. And so it's, uh, it just shows how tumultuous it can be in, in such a short season, but with such long races. Right. 
Yeah. What is it then about this endurance racing that appeals to you so much? It's a great format and um, it requires so much more. Growing up in single seaters, it's just, you know, how fast can you go? And that's mm. all that matters, right? So much stems from qualifying and then you do a short 30 or 45 minute race and, you know, bam, it's over. Where these races have a lot more depth. Um, I love the strategy front because it's really, really critical in ELMS. Um, and it's one that, you know, you, you can take some gambles on and, you know, or you can hedge your bets. It's, it's like four hours of gambling while walking on a tightrope. It's, you know, it's, um, there's so many different dynamics to the races that make it, um, thrilling and, you know, really easy to screw up in the process as well. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a curious one because on the one hand, you feel like you see some race highlights sometimes on, on YouTube or wherever, and they narrow the four hours down into such a short window and you think, oh, not much happened there then. But I find when you do get the chance to watch those races fully, because it's, again, sometimes it clashes with something like it's in the way or what have you, but you get really kind of invested in there and it's quite hard to, it's quite easy rather to get hypnotized kind of by it. I found that especially in the World Drugs Championship and then very much with, with Elms this year. It's, it's, it's a curious one because, like you say, with other racing, it's just foot to the floor and go for it. Exactly, exactly. And I would say the only thing that could be better is for the strategy to be a little easier to understand, especially on the P3 front, because we do think we're the only class that has the, uh, the minimum length pit stops where, you know, we mm. have two, two stops that are typically 105 seconds long. And yeah. where you place yeah. those during the race makes such a big difference. With the the P twos are just doing them, you know, banging them out as fast as they can. Okay, it changes things when they take tires or don't take tires. But for us, you know, to to land one of those long stops during an FCY, or yeah, we rarely get them on the safety car because the pits are closed for three laps. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, to land one of those under FCY is a forty second gain on track. Um, Suppose from a viewer that makes it more interesting for me, so I don't mind it as much. But my, right. from a driver's perspective, you're like, oh, why? Yeah, um, but I have a lot of family that watches, and they're like, oh, we don't, you know, don't really understand. You were you were 40 seconds back for the first two hours, and then all of a sudden you have a one minute lead. It's like, well, yes, <laughs> we, we did these stops early on, and you know we were behind, but the other teams hadn't done their stops, so you know it's uh, it where sense. you are. <laughs> where you are virtually versus where you are actually. So, mm. And so as well with European Le Mans, you've got different categories all racing at the same time. How natural does it feel to be racing alongside those other categories in the same race? And does it ever become a bit frustrating for you? Um, I won't say that it doesn't become frustrating <laughs> because there are times where you're trying to, to hunt someone down and you just, you know, I think that there is a lot you know, a driver can do with traffic, but sometimes things are just poorly placed, you know, where, where the guy in front of you gets the GTE car into turn one down the straight, and then you're stuck behind them for the next whole first sector. You know, it's, um, that's, that's the frustrating bit, but it can also play in your favor and it's just, you know, how, how things line up and, and time out. Um, the P2s have been interesting, and this is my third year of ELMS, and obviously the P2s have been slowed down kind of every year since um, the start. And it used to be that the P2s had enough power to really pass you out of nearly anywhere. With the reduction in power and the added weight and the removal of the downforce on the P2s, it's almost made them, they have a lot harder time passing a P3 now, mm-hmm. which has made them more desperate as well um so you really have to watch them because you know especially towards the end of the race you get the the platinums and the golds in there and they're just uh you know they're going to throw it up the inside whether it works or not and it's up to you uh, to make sure that it it works um which sometimes compromises our lap time or what we're trying to do but um yeah it's uh it's been worse as they're closer in pace with us so it's it's a curious thing there, but at the same time, it makes sense. Like, don't don't slow the cars down even quicker. It helps everyone. Exactly, exactly. And honestly, I don't know the 
the GTEs are, you go certain places and they're quite difficult to get around as well. So mm. they, you know, it's, I think um, Barcelona, for example, you've got a couple of good straights there, but then a lot of the corners, it's doable, but it's not straightforward by any means of the imagination. No, no. And they're also a little beefier than we are. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to certainly be careful with them. And if that's the most frustrating aspect, then what to you is the most difficult aspect of endurance racing? I think being disciplined, and, and this is where I really think we've we've grown as a team and a driver lineup and everything else is, is being disciplined to remind ourselves that it's four hours mm. and that, and, and I have two very young single-seater <laughs> teammates so we've we've all had to learn this together, but just knowing that we don't need to get every second out of it, um, mm. and the removal of risk has been what has helped us win all these races. Um, it, it's the it's kind of the change in thought process from that single seater mentality of like we have to pick up every single thing we can to weighing the risk and reward benefit of everything of just saying like, you know what, we have some margin right now. Let's, let's be really smart. We don't need to show our pace. You know, I don't need to look stellar on the averages this race because we have a one minute margin and we don't need to take any risk whatsoever. Um, in, in learning these things and just calming down and making sure we get from start to finish without a single hiccup, without knocking off a dive plane, without touching anybody, without dropping wheels or, you know, risking punctures and this and this, it's just like it's learning to slow down is the hardest thing. So it's, it's as a racing driver, you must have the instinct, like you say, to always be going as fast as you can, because that makes the most sense for you to be able to win. But it's, again, if you don't think to get the, the perfect lap or as close as you can get, you would go slower, but you need that sometimes. And I imagine that especially coming from single seaters, even if it was a while ago, you still have that, that mentality there. It's a bit odd to, to get around that initially, at least. It's, it's definitely odd to get around that, and it's not natural. Um, but I think that you do enough of these and you look back and you're like, oh, man, you know, only three cars finished on the lead lap. Like, all we had to do is just drive around and we would have had a really good result. And it's, yeah, that's exactly right. And that's what we have to you know, have to figure out and have to be just, and it's so, so disciplined. And it's that, that pass in traffic of like, I think I can get it done versus mm. let's sit behind them for another half a lap and, and get it done completely cleanly. Um, so or, that's the thing with endurance racing as well, because it's four hours, you never know what's going to happen over the course of that time. So if that's the situation where it's happening fairly early on, you maybe don't want to risk that. Whereas if it is last 20 minutes, Maybe you shouldn't risk that if you're in a good position anyway, because you don't want to then mess up the whole four hours of it. But you can maybe have that mentality more then because it's more worth that that risk for that place, maybe. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and and that took us two races to learn. It really, really did. But then Granted, once you learned it. It's it seemed to work pretty well so far. So uh fingers crossed that it keeps working. Um but uh no, it's and and I have to say that that Nico and Guillermo have been really really good for having two seventeen year old teammates. Um, they've been pretty flawless and really smart with what they're doing. So that's that's half of it as well. Because again, it's not to keep going about single seaters, but it's weird than having teammates that not only are they because I mean in single seaters where well, you can have the teammates, but you're not necessarily working with them or you only work with them to a certain extent because if you give too much of your hand away, it maybe helps them more than it helps you. Whereas this, it's all about the team. It's you need to be as transparent as possible there because if one of you does well, then you can all do benefit from that. Exactly. Exactly. I think it's fair to say that you also know Isla Eckham fairly well, and she just <laughs> made her. W Series returned to Singapore, which was great to see. Would you want to do a race with her at some point? You know, we uh, we actually got pretty close a couple of times in Le Mans Cup um, with uh, with Mjolnir because uh, I had uh, a few. She's driven for Mjolnir, and so have I. It just hasn't uh, hasn't lined up. But um, no, it would certainly be a lot of fun. We've mm. we've never been heads up with each other as well, and that's one of the big questions we've asked all well, the time. <laughs> <laughs> who, who's going to beat who? And I, you know, 
I've always said it's probably best we don't find out because I don't think <laughs> either one of us would take super well to it. So we're, we're both racing drivers and very competitive. Um, but uh, no, it would be fun to, to do a race. Maybe, maybe the way to balance that out would be you go back to single seat to, to race her and then she comes into your kind of racing and balances out maybe. There's maybe more of a 50-50 on that one. It, it, exactly, exactly. Where would you love to go racing in the future that you haven't yet? Um, I think the, we all have a bucket list of, you know, uh, Macau and this and this, but the one, the one that I do for certain want to do is Le Mans. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it would be a, a really great experience. I don't think that I'll be bronze next year from, from what I've seen. And, uh, that's a little bit of a shame because the P2M class is, uh, certainly my best shot at, at winning that race. Um, but maybe in a number of years, I'll come back and uh, if P2AM class is still there or there's a proper AM class, that uh, go give them all a go and see, see if we can't win the, the crown jewel. But uh, honestly, it doesn't get much better than ELMS at the moment. You know, I did Daytona this year and that's a blast and, and a really, really cool race. But as far as a full championship goes, the circuits we go to and how the racing is and how how high the level is, I don't think much beats LMS. And I think as well, nothing against Barcelona, but Monza and Spa winning there is quite special. Le Mans would be kind of the third thing to make that really special there, I think. 100%. 100%. couple of fun non-motorsport questions to finish off then. If you had to sing a song for karaoke, what would you choose? Oh man, um, I think no matter what it was, uh, I'd clear the bar out pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret um, talent of yours, though. That's uh, no, no. I, I would say singing is pretty far down on the list of my talents. Um, but uh, as Garrett Grisk can attest, I think that uh, one of the only songs that I know all the words to is uh, Toby Keith's "Courtesy of the Red, White, and Blue." You know, being a Texan. <laughs> I'm not a massive country guy, but that's a, that's a pretty good one and, and works well with the Texas stereotype. It definitely does. Uh, final question then. If you could play a round of golf with any historical figure, who would you choose? Uh, dead or alive, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Oh, man. This is, a, this is definitely a, a difficult one. Um. It's always the non-motorsport things that catch people out. Like yeah, it, it really is. And and this is one that, you know, here in 20 minutes, I'll probably have some really great, uh, great answers to. But um, <laughs> um, no, I, instinct. I would say Michael Schumacher. I think um, okay. why I really have a lot of respect for Michael is, is not his on-track performance, but how he was able to get into an organization and – you know, turn the tide of the team and, and mm. motivate people around him, um, which I think is is one of the biggest things that a lot of drivers lack. And they sit there and say, oh, the car is not fast enough. And, you know, it's like, no, you're not motivating the people to, to get you where you need to be. Um, so, yeah, I'd go with that one. That's so not a bad choice at all and takes it back to most people, which I cannot complain about. <laughs> <laughs> Well, exactly. it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you and I want to wish you the best of luck for Porter Mao and fingers crossed for the championship and hopefully I've not done nothing to, to harm your chances there by saying that. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get to see you at Le Mans soon. I'll say that yep. in one of more elongated versions of the word. There. <laughs> well, thanks for having me and uh, no, it's been great. Charles for coming up to the curve with me and I want to wish him the best of luck again for the future. Join me again soon when I'll be chatting to another famous face from the world of motorsport. And in the meantime, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and check out the other videos on the On The Curves YouTube channel. If you want to hear more from me, you can listen to me chat about F1, amongst other things, over on the Undercut podcast. And you can also hear me dissecting everything Nitro RX related, including chatting with special guests, over on the Nitro RX podcast. Both podcasts are available here on YouTube as well as over on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you like to listen. 
You can also follow me over on Instagram at t.albert.daily to follow the curbs and read my various motorsport articles over on Is It Fast and Paddock Sobriety. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again next week for the next episode.